We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. If you can find a social media site we're not on, point it out because I'll go swat the name if nothing else. Now, the best way for questions to get to us is through the website. They won't get missed. They won't get lost. They go right into my Gmail. It's perfect. If it goes by on Twitter, there is a chance I'll miss it. I'm not going to say no, though, if you ask me a question anywhere on the web or, heck, in person. Well, in about a week, a uh, week and a half, gamers over all over the world are going to be gathering in support of the Extra Life charity Gaming Marathon that raises money for Children's Miracle Network hospitals. Now, here in Windsor, this is going to be my seventh year helping to organize the local Extra Life efforts. And one of the questions I get asked all the time by local gamers, people who are involved in Windsor Extra Life, or even online when I'm talking about supporting Extra Life, is what can I do to help raise money through tabletop gaming? And that's what I want to talk about today. What we've found works over the years, what's worked for us, lessons we've learned, and other great ways to raise money for charities through gaming. And not just for Extra Life either, what we're going to talk about today could be for any fundraising event. Now, not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but the most basic way to raise money playing games is pretty simple. You schedule a game day and then ask people to donate money while you play. Asking friends, family, and strangers for pledges towards a cause is basically the tried and true method of raising money for any charity event that's been around probably since the dawn of time. Your basic gameathon idea. Play games, give money, everybody wins. Now, this pledge drive can be done by dropping off pledge sheets. Uh, that's probably one of the most common ways. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these in your workplace or in your school. Uh, you could always bring a sheet in. Uh, you could go door to door in your neighborhood, or you can hit up local businesses, local stores, or hit up people at the local game store, especially for a gaming event. More common nowadays, though, of course, is to look for donations online. Now, most charities themselves have online donation pages and getting people to pledge is more just a matter of going to the site, signing up and then sending out tweets or social media posts. Now, this is the way Extra Life does things. We've got a Windsor Extra Life page set up where people can donate and join our team. Now, even if people can't donate online, social media is a fantastic place to get the word out about your fundraiser, as well as contact people directly when looking for donations. The key to success in these cases is numbers. You can't expect a lot of people to be donating $50, but mm -hmm. if you can get $50 or 50 people to give you $10 or even $5, you're doing great. Well, it's not much fun and actually requires footwork. Actually getting out there, letting people know what you're doing and just asking for support is often one of the best ways to raise money. It's awkward and gamers aren't always the most social people. So check with friends and family first, get a couple of donations on the page so that if you do, are repeat, uh, reaching out to a random strangers, they aren't at the top of the list and it makes it easier to break the ice and get money flowing. Now, while someone might not be willing to support just a regular game night, hey, we're going to go play some games, you should give us money, right? That, that's a hard sell people are going to be more interested in supporting something special, something more than just a normal game night, like, say, a gaming marathon. This is where people are going to play one game for an extended period of time, like, say, we're going to play D&D &D for 24 hours, or we're going to play multiple games over a larger period of time. Now, this is the secret of the success of Extra Life itself. The main event is a charity gaming marathon, that asks the participants to game for 24 hours. Now, these 24 hours don't have to be in a row, but they do ask all the participants to play games for a total of 24 hours at some point leading up to the event or on the day of the event. Now, due to this, our Windsor Extra Life event is going to be running from 10 a.m. Saturday, November 2nd until 6 p.m. Sunday, November the 3rd. This gives players 33 hours to get their 24 hours in. No, 33 hours because daylight savings time hits during then. So we're going to get an extra hour that night. So in addition to this, because we don't want to unduly stress people out, we also held a 12-hour Extra Life warm-up event back in August. Now, at this event, players could get in some charity gaming hours early and bank them, basically. 
That way they didn't have to do it all at once. That's something I did. I've already gamed for 12 hours back in August for Extra Life, and I'll be gaming a lot more in the coming weekend. Now, while gaming for 25 hours straight is definitely more impressive, and it might even raise you more money, it's just not healthy. And we don't want anyone risking their health for the sake of a gaming event, even if it is a charity gaming event. The human body isn't designed to do much for 24 hours straight, but sitting in one place and staying awake definitely isn't in the plan. Know your body and your limits. Stretch, eat, move, and if you need to, stop. It's okay. All right, getting a group together to play board games isn't usually that hard. I realize there are some people out there that do struggle with this, and I apologize. We have other episodes on trying to find a game group. Casual gaming is usually pretty easy to come by nowadays, whether it's just with friends or at a gaming cafe or local game stores. Like, there's gaming sites popping up everywhere. Barnes & Noble's host game nights. The Chapters Indigo house game nights. You can pretty much find a game night anywhere nowadays. What isn't common, though, are competitive board gaming or competitive events where players are going to be rewarded for playing. That's why tournaments are so popular. A simple board game tournament like the Windsor Extra Life Board Game Blitz we spoke about last week, even. Now, the Board Game Blitz is a multiple round, no elimination tournament featuring a wide variety of games. Not every tournament has to be like this. For example, the Tecumseh Corn Fest, which is a local farmer's festival, the, a fall harvest festival, features a Settlers of Catan tournament every year. That showcases not only one game, but it's also set up in a traditional bracket format where players are eliminated each round. Other formats are, of course, possible. There are tons of tournament formats out there. No, absolutely. And you can pick up more tips for tournaments from our last episode, The Mixer. Now, the big decision when hosting a board game tournament is figuring out what you're going to do for prizes and how you're going to actually raise money for your charity that you're supporting. Now, the easiest way to do this, I got to say, is just charge an entry fee and split that so that so much of the entry fee goes towards the donations to the whatever charity you're supporting. And the other half goes toward or half or whatever percentage you choose goes to prizes. Now, this is what I've done in the past. I usually do 50 50, to be honest. A better option, though, is if you can find someone, whether it's a local store or a game publisher, a designer, someone in the local community to donate the prizes, then you can give more or all of that entry fee to the charity. While hosting the tournament, too, you can also add in additional incentives to get people to show up and additional ways to donate. Things like door prizes, raffles, items for sale, and so on. Now, the Extra Life concept really started out as more of a video game concept. And that's okay, because a lot of those same ideas work for us in the board game world as well. There are a lot of similarities to running a successful event mm -hmm. as running a successful stream. And the one big thing streamers do, and the, the you'll see all the big streamers doing mm -hmm. this to keep people attention, is giveaways. It keeps people hooked. It keeps people wanting more. That's what we need. That's what we're doing wrong. We got to start giving stuff away. That, that, <laughs> that'll be our, our, new, our new secret. <laughs> all right. People love the chance to win something and are often willing to spend money for a chance, even if the odds aren't so good. I found people are willing to spend even more of their hard-earned money when the money's going to a good cause. For this reason, things like raffles, draws, door prizes, and other giveaways can be fantastic for raising money for charities. While it may sound crass, whatever you can do to separate people from their money, it's for charity. Yes. Uh, raffles. Pretty simple, right? People buy tickets of some sort for a chance to win something. If it's a gaming event, you're probably going to give away games. Or or even better sometimes is things for games. Stuff like dice. Things where no one's going to win a game they already own, right? Uh, check out our gift guides on the webpage for lots of non-game gift type of ideas. But anyway, what you're going to do is you're going to sell tickets. You're probably going to have a discount for buying five tickets or an arm length or something. Uh, the thing to watch here, though, which is really important and a lot of people may not realize, is make sure your raffle is legal. This varies by state to state, province to province. In some places, a raffle is considered gambling, and you have to have a gambling license in order to host a raffle. It's true, actually, here in Windsor for some things, and it's kind of up in the air for some other things. We, we've had debates over this. Uh, most of the time, yes, the authorities will overlook it for charity purposes, and if you're making under $10,000, maybe your extra life raises $20,000, then it becomes an issue. 
Raffles are another case where you can use the money gathered to provide a prize as well, with only a portion of the proceeds going to charity, right? Your standard 50-50 draw, except the other 50 doesn't go to the house, it goes to a prize. Uh, it goes to the charity, right? People take home 50, their 50 goes to charity. Even better, though, is the same thing I mentioned with the tournament, is if you can get someone to donate prizes, then all that money raised can go to the cause. Now, we aren't lawyers. We don't play them on TV either. So check your local uh, check your local rulings for uh, any yes. gambling laws. Yeah, if raffles can fall under gambling. That's basically the concern. Any giveaways can too. You may have to have your person who wins enter a skill testing question. And then it's a prize instead of a giveaway. All things to look into. Now, draws and giveaways work best when you have an event that has an entry fee or something else that supports your charity gaming efforts, right? Like you're having that board game tournament and charging people to play. While the draw itself, like if you're just going to draw or do, do door prizes, aren't going to raise you any money on their own. It's the fact that you're having the draw that will increase attendance at your event. Just the fact that you're giving away something for free can be an incentive enough for some people to come out to your event. People love easy and free stuff. It just works. And once they're in the door, then you get the other options. Yeah. Now, another thing you can do is sell stuff. Sell stuff to make money at your charity gaming event. When there's a charity involved, I find that people are more willing to spend their money, often on things they may not have bought in the first place if they didn't have a cause to support. Now, there are a ton of things you can sell at a gaming event to raise money. You could ask local gamers, publishers, stores, and distributors to donate games and then sell them at the event with all or a portion of the proceeds going to the charity. Like this can be a great chance for local gamers to clear out some old games from their collection and support charity at the same time. Yeah, and just try to stay on theme. Selling antiques might not be your best choice <laughs> at a board game event, but then again, if you know your market, <laughs> Yeah, I can't see that going over overly well, but we did sell a sword at one of our Extra Life events, so that's the case. Now, what we found is a really classic thing is bake sales. Bake sales always do well at our charity events. This is especially true when combined with a marathon gaming event like Extra Life. People like snacks and treats, and well, the longer they're there gaming, the more they're going to be tempted to pick up something to munch on. Now, for our overnight events, the secret here, now we do have the best pizza in the world, so that's partly why, is order pizza at midnight and then sell off the slices for a bit more than the cost of the full pizza. The difference gets donated to the charity. Especially if you can do little things like rounding up. If that slice costs a buck fifteen and you sell it for two, people mm -hmm. won't bat an eye at $2 for a slice of pizza, and you'll probably even sell more than if you were asking for exact change. Yeah, very true. Yeah, we tend to round up. And even better, if you can get a local pizza place to donate, we did have a, a place do that last year, which was fantastic. Unfortunately, the place has since burned down. Nothing to do with us. Now, a game-filled charity auction can bring in a lot of money. Over the years, our most successful moneymaker in seven years of running Extra Life events here in Windsor have been our annual Geek and Gaming Live auction. It's going to be a live auction it's held in the middle of our big gaming marathon uh 7 p.m on saturday this year usually around that time it usually goes for about two hours for weeks leading up to this event we asked local gamers to donate new and used games and other geeky items we also we've had pokemon star wars superhero stuff right most geeks and gamers there's a lot of overlap there now in addition we approach a number of local businesses as well as non local and non local tabletop game publishers looking for donations. By the day of the event, we usually have around 200 items to auction off, which is amazing. Now, just remember that you have to manage, organize, and transport all those items. Yes. And that includes making sure they remain in the condition that you got them in. Yes. Now, due to the overwhelming support we've gotten over the last couple of years, with our auction, we've actually started to split things now. So not only do we have a live auction, we also have a silent auction. Uh, we handpick basically the, some of the best items that have been donated and allow people to silently bid throughout the entire event. Uh, this lets us keep the live auction down to a reasonable time limit, somewhat reasonable time limit, uh, and help save the auctioneer's voice on the day of the event because they don't have to necessarily sell all 200 items. Now, both auctions raise us a ton of money. Both formats work. Whatever works for you, it's worth doing. Um, I do know people, another local store also does a raffle-style auction where you there's a bunch of different items and you drop your raffle tickets into it. Again, check with raffles and local laws. Also with auctions, true, actually check with auctions and local laws. There might be something for that too. 
literally more than half of what we raise every year has come from these auctions. Like this is the biggest thing that has worked for us. Now I'm not guaranteeing it will work for you, but like we have people come from out of town just to participate in these auctions because it's so much stuff and the prices usually go for better than MSRP. People are usually getting deals. Plus, we usually get some sweet stuff like promos that you can't necessarily get anywhere else. Like, I've still got a uh, Will Wheaton Felicia Day for Dead of Winter auction this year. Stuff like that. Yeah. Now, like Sean mentioned, though, this does take quite a bit of work to organize. But I think a gaming auction can be one of the best ways to raise money for charity where gaming is concerned. So, auctions can, of course, have their problems, though. So, if you've never run one, make sure to go out and see a couple. See if you can find out what works, what doesn't. Try to learn ahead so that your first one can be the best it can be. And then you'll just keep getting better from there. You will make some mistakes. There will be some slip ups, but we have some tips to help you get off on your right foot. Yeah, start off, set a starting bid uh, long before the auction starts. Don't be up there on the stage trying to decide where to start your starting bid at. You want this starting bid to be low because you want people bidding. But if it's a rare item, don't start it too low. You don't want a signed Batman drawn by Matt Finch going for $20, as I've seen locally. Dave Finch, sorry, I said Matt Finch, Ron, Ron Finch, Dave Finch, Batman. Um, people are looking for deals. But if you've got like a $40 game, start at five bucks. Um, that's a big one. Note this price on an index card. Index cards are gonna save your life. This is what I've learned having now done seven of these things. Our first one didn't go that smoothly. Our last one went better than ever. You're going to note things on the index card with the starting bid, but also the MSRP for the game or item, because someone's going to ask, someone out there is going to wonder what it's worth. If the game is rare or out of print, note that. At that case, you may want to actually look up like the eBay going rate. So like, hey, this game goes for 200 bucks on eBay, gets people to bid. Now, when someone wins the item, all you're going to do is write down the winning bid price on the index card and give that card to the person who won. And then they sit back down. No changing money, no swapping games, none of that in the middle of the auction. At the end of the event, once you're all done, people bring up their cards, pay for the items, and then get them and go. Now, what I suggest is have a few volunteers, what I like to call runners, to help you with this. People who can run and hand out the cards and stuff like that, and also hold up the games. Finally, if at all possible, accept digital money, accept credit and debit at your auction if at all possible. Now for us, the local game store that we host the auction at, the CG Realm, has been fantastic and allows us to use their debit machine. And they're even cool enough to soak the fees for doing so, which is awesome on them. Now in the States, this can be even easier as there are plenty more options like Stripe and other providers that will take electronic uh, funds out and about uh, portable right hooked up to your phone. But it is really important. Someone is just much more likely to spend big money from their account, especially when many people just don't carry that much cash with them these days. Yeah, that's another thing to push. Okay, before your event's happening, warn people to bring cash, right? If you're going to have raffles, draws, baked goods for sale, make sure people know that before they get to the event. So that's just a good generic tip that kind of goes with all of this. All right, doing something special and charging for it is a great way to raise money. Now, what I mean by something special is something out of the ordinary, something you don't see at a regular game night, something you don't see at your local game store, something you don't see at a gaming cafe. If you're doing something unique like this, you can charge people money for it as long as it's going to charity. Well, you might be able to charge money for it normally, but that's a totally different topic. As an example, we recently had our Level Up for Extra Life charity RPG event here in Windsor. Like, there are role-playing game nights at the local game store, but this was a dedicated day of role-playing at the local game store. We had local game masters showing off games. We had some company support there. We even had a couple celebrities there. So we had Victoria Rogers of the Broadswords there. We had Terry Latorco, who works for Renegade Games, able to come out. And we just had local, some of the best DMs in the area, running some hot games. And we just charged people five bucks each to play RPGs for the day. Yeah, never underestimate the ability of celebrities to draw in people to events. Even local celebrities can be draws. And when you've got big names in the gaming community, there can be plenty of options for fundraising. Even as simple as an autograph session for a small donation uh, is something that could add up. If you go to the Windsor event, you get to meet the tabletop bellhop. Come on. 
Now, another example of a special event is that the local Artemis crew is going to be set up at our Extra Life event in November and showing off the Artemis Starship Bridge Crew Simulator. If you haven't heard about this thing, it's basically a Star Trek LARP. Uh, they're going to be charging a small fee to play through a scenario, as well as offering some other incentive for players to donate. Now, not only is Artemis a great game, but it's a big draw, too. We talk about games that look great on the table. Well, imagine having five or six people all sitting around with computers and controllers working together to fly a spaceship. Yeah. That's just cool. And that is something that's going to appeal to any of your sci-fi fans. Now, another example. In October, I hosted an RPG book exchange. And what we did to raise money for that is we just charged a flat participation fee. 100% of that fee went to Extra Life. Now, at this event, this is an event where people bring in their old game books they're not using anymore and trade them with other gamers in the hope that they get stuff that they want, or at least new stuff. Uh, we use a point-based system, so it's not actual money-changing hands, and that way it values the books at just relative value. It's a more abstract system to try to keep things fair. Now, besides raising some money for this event, it let players get rid of their old RPGs that have sat dusty on their shelves forever and bring something new home to check out. And gamers will often have a lot to trade if you give them the right push. Many of us are hoarders to a greater or lesser degree, as the background of uh, the Bill Hobbs will show you. Uh, and who knows who may want that thing you've been keeping for years, but aren't sure why you've been keeping it. Oh, heck, at the last one, I got a copy unpunched of Silent Death. I thought that was awesome. All right, another example of a special event. So at our event in November, the Hidden Trail Escape Rooms team will be offering a unique custom escape room experience at the CG Realm during our marathon. All of the money raised from that is getting donated to Extra Life. Uh, Brent's even got a volunteer to run the room for him who's not getting paid for the day, which is awesome. Personally, I am really looking forward to spending a few bucks on that one. Yeah, I've only been involved in big pro escape rooms to date, so I'm really interested in seeing what they have as a more portable option. Yeah, it's supposed to be like a 15-minute room, which is supposed to be so we can just keep rotating people in and out of it. <laughs> Five to eight people teams. It sounds really cool. Plus, Brent's been doing escape rooms in Windsor now for almost as long as we've been having extra life events. Excellent. And I can almost guarantee you we're going to have a big escape room up to eight people in the auction this year because Brent donated one every year. And if he hasn't yet, I'm going to poke him until he does. So. <laughs> Because I've gotten him to donate for six years. I think Deanna's correcting me there. I think it's been six years he's been running escape rooms here in Windsor. I think he's got like five or six different rooms now. Excellent. So basically, all, all this takes is some out-of-box thinking. You, you're just trying to come up with something special, something out of the ordinary, something that people would be willing to spend some money on that they that they wouldn't normally spend on a normal game night. I think about it, things like a paint and take miniature painting tutorial, or how about an intro to D and D session for brand new players? Whatever you can think of that you would be willing to spend money on or would have spent money on when you were new to the hobby, there's a good chance someone else is going to agree with you and want to spend money on that. All right. This is the, the big one. In my opinion, this is the one that tends to blow people's minds. Anyone who's been to our events, seen them many times, but one of the most successful things we have done to raise money for charity is let people cheat. Well, the auctions are what raise us the most money every year, but that's just because of volume. The cheat jars are in a very, very close second place. Like we raise thousands of dollars with people cheating during our charity gaming events. We encourage people to cheat. These events are meant to be fun. Raising money for a good cause. It's all about having fun and getting people to part with their money. We aren't worried about who wins or loses each individual game or who even who's winning overall or losing overall. That's why I have the Board Game Blitz tournament a couple weeks before our main event. If you want a competition to see who's the best gamer, show up to the tournament, raise some money that way. On the night of the event, during Extra Life, one of the most fun ways to get people to part with their cash to let them cheat. Out on the tables, at the store, we're going to have a number of cheat jars. They're just mason jars I got from Dollarama. I put some extra life branding on them, like I printed on my own printer, nothing fancy. With those, I put out sheets of paper with a bunch of suggested cheats. These cheats include a variety of things. For example, a buck, player can reroll a die, draw a new card, move an extra square, take one extra resource from the bank, and so on. For five bucks, you just pass that roll. You make that saving throw. Oh, you can just discard your hand and draw a new one. Or you know what? That miniature out in the middle of nowhere, he's got cover. I don't know where it came from, but he's got cover. Heck, for five bucks, take another turn, right? These are all suggestions, and we encourage players to come up with their own. 
Let's be honest, especially at a 24-hour gaming session, odds will not always be in your favor. So have fun with it. Cheat to win, cheat to lose, cheat for a better story. It's all for charity. We even have players who aren't playing the games sometimes go by and cheat for other players or for the DM. It's fantastic. We have found the cheat jars to be particularly popular with RPGs, specifically RPGs with high character casualty expectations. Games like Paranoia and Dungeon Crawl Classics have raised us a ton of money over the years. But even with a standard game like Dungeons and Dragons, letting the players cheat does something unique to the game. It lets the DM ramp up the excitement and the difficulty level of their scenarios. And by doing that, you almost force the players to cheat, right? Like you make it a little extra hard. A charity gaming event is a great time to see if your D&D group can kill a Terrasque or take down Orcus. Extra fate point? No problem. Extra spell in your time of need? Sure thing. It's all just a donation away <laughs> and for a great cause. That makes it sound so much like microtransactions and terrible. <laughs> Don't let Wizards of the Coast listen to this episode or they're going to start doing this for their organized play. Now, one thing. When you are allowing cheating, make sure everyone has buy-in. Make sure everyone participating buys in for the cheating. You want to encourage cheating. Like, seriously, everyone that walks in the door should be cheating. Every game that's played should ha allow cheating. But you know what? There are some more competitive gamers out there that want nothing to do with cheating. They want a fair fight. Tournaments are probably a place where you put the cheat jars away and not allow them. We do have a couple tournaments on our event going on on Saturday, Sunday that will not have cheating in them. Actually, I think we're, actually one might at least one tournament going on in the weekend is not going to have cheating. Instead, they're raising money by charging a participation fee. Fair enough. Just be sure everyone at the table is cool with cheating, but do that. The important thing we talk about session zero, we talk about pregame talk. We talk about cats and all that. This is the same thing. Before you start playing, make sure it's on the table and you know. Now, the assumption at our events is they're cheating. So in my opinion, if you don't want cheating, bring that up before you start the game. While I'm not the most competitive gamer in the first place, you have to know your time. Tournaments where there are prizes for winning? Skip the cheap jar. Fun weekend of gaming for charity? Go on, throw your money in the jar and do that thing you've always wanted to do in the game. Now, finally, just to wrap up, one of the most important things to remember when you're having a special gaming event like this is that you are raising money for an important cause, whether that's extra life or some other charity. Remind players and participants why they're there. Encourage people to spend money. Point out where the money's going. Let them know that this is going for charity. This isn't just another game night. It's a charity game night. Everyone should be there to have fun, but you're also there to raise money for your cause. Have fun, but keep your eye on the prize. And last but not least, thank people. A lot. All the time. Thank sponsors, guests, players, hosts. Make sure you remind people that this is a great job everyone is doing for charity. You know what? I am going to take a moment right there and bring up our list of sponsors for our Windsor Extra Life event. I apologize for those of you having to listen to me type because I know it's close to the microphone. But Sean makes a good point there that I didn't have in the show notes he added. It's true. Thank people. Thank your volunteers. Thank the people organizing. Thank the venue for hosting you. Thank the person coming in and setting up escape rooms. Thank the people spending money. Thank the people bringing games. Thank the people who show up at 3 in the morning with a coffee. All of it. Let people know they are appreciated. Uh, and also, while Mo is typing, uh, just before we get into the lobby, I'm going to sort of jump in there a little early. Uh, Inch Games brought up uh, an important point is PR. Uh, letting, letting publicity, getting publicity out there, type up a little press, uh, a little press notice, send it out to your local, uh, media. If you've got a local TV station, if you've got a local radio station that does, uh, local events, get that out there. And, and, you know, it's charity. People are not mm -hmm. going to say, oh, it's a bunch of gamers. Ignore that. No, no, this is for charity. They will report. They may even send someone by. You may even get a spot yep. on the news. Yeah, we were putting a press release a little late this year. All right, so a huge thanks to all of the Windsor Extra Life sponsors. Here's your public shout out. Uh, Tabletop L Up, that's us. Yeah, we're doing a lot of work for Extra Life this year. The CG Realm, that's our venue. That's where we're playing. They are doing so much for us, allowing us to have the space, staying open overnight, uh, donating the tips from the sandwich shop, stuff like that. Thank you. Tabletop Renaissance, MSI, Parallel Games, Albers Tool and Mold, Far Off Games, L.M. Clark, Chip Theory Games, Geek Life, Hidden Trail, ITS, Spartan Sling, Stronghold Games, 
First Frontier, Mind Clash Games, Level 99 Games, Atlas Games, Ares Games, Easy Mode, Red Raven, Weird City Games, Board Game Bliss, Leader Games, The Coffee Exchange, Green Feet Games, GMT Games, Garfield Games, Odd Bird, and The Broadswords. Also, now, thank you to everyone who has helped get things set up this year. See you at the event. And now, let's check back into the lobby. So we've had a lot of chat going on here, and I apologize awesome. to the people in the uh, chat room because there's no way we're going to get to everything people have talked about in here. Um, he well, hasn't copied any key parts for us. Uh, huh? So, oh, okay. so uh, one of the one of the issues people are running into, and and you do always have to be cautious of, is uh, if you are going around and asking people for money for donations. Back when going back all the way to back to our gameathon concept, mm -hmm. um, do pay, pay attention. You know, especially in this day and age in the gig economy where people are struggling desperately to you know pay their bills. Um, you know. Just be aware of who you're asking uh, money for. It may actually be almost easier to ask strangers when you know that that friend of yours just worked a uh, 20 hour shift so that they could buy groceries this week. Very fair. Um, Xanister brings up jumping jacks. Uh, you know, again, it's really important not to sit down for too long and not get up and move and, you know, and stay active during the You know these what long, we should do? Uh, during events. the event, a couple times, we should like set an alarm and tell everyone. Hey, everyone stand up, stretch, get up, take a walk around. Might not be a bad idea. We could, we could do the Apple Watch thing at 10 minutes to the hour. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what the Apple Watch thing is. But sure. 10, minute, 10 minutes to the hour, they, they remind you that you haven't gotten your 250 steps in yet. Oh, or whatever go. it is. Because um, I know Fitbit, Fitbit has the same option available. So it's just one of those reminders. It's like, hey, you haven't done anything this hour. You should need to get some steps in. Yeah, um, press releases are important. Getting the word out, that's, to be honest, that's a totally different topic. We should talk about advertising your gaming events, whether it's charity or not. That that could be a whole thing. Flyers, uh, Facebook events. Uh, we don't recommend Meetup anymore. Uh, other online sources. Board Game Geek, that's somewhere I totally forgot about. Like, I'm running one of the biggest local game board game things of the year, and I didn't think to put it on Board Game Geek till last week. That's now there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to take a nap. That's one I see many times. That's yeah. part of why we have the store open for 33 hours is if you do want to do the full 24, you can do 12 hours, go home, take a nap, get some sleep, come back, play the other 12. Yep. No, absolutely. There's a ton of different op uh, ways out there and it really is important to pay attention to your body and your health, uh, not rub Timbit flakes into your eyes, not, <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever, it, whatever it takes to make sure you're healthy. Uh, we've got some in the back of uh, Mo's picture there. We've got some of the uh, uh, QR codes available. Yep. So a quick and easy way to donate, easy to make up and print uh, so that people with their cell phone can walk up and, uh, you know, just scan the link and be right there ready to donate uh, to the cause. Uh, Here's a good little one. things like that. Good one for Extra Life from Danielle on our chat. Uh, take your extra Halloween candy. Bring it. Sell it cheap. Small and cheap. Sell it. Sell it. Give, pe give people five bucks a handful. If yeah, I mean, if if you're gaming for twenty four hours, you aren't going to bat an eye at, at you know pumping some extra sugar into you. Yes. To, to keep going. Uh, some people were talking about uh, what they called Chinese auctions, which is you buy raffle tickets yeah, and you put the raffle tickets into uh, into buckets. Um, and 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 some are suggesting that you know that that may be right for a certain audience and possibly not gamers. Um, I to be honest, that is what one local store did last year and managed to raise $300. Now, yeah. based on the amount of product they seem to have in, I think that was a losing proposition for them. Not like they donated it. They're not losing anything, but it, it didn't, they didn't seem to get the value for it. Yeah. It's one of those things where um, you have to want to donate to the event and not care as much about the auction. Uh, one of the reasons it works with, uh, you know, like church groups and stuff like that, these people are going to give money to the church yeah. to anyway. So they just buy a bunch of tickets and, and then they throw some things in the buckets because they want them. Whereas a lot of the cases for our auctions, this is stuff people want. They want to bid on that. They want to spend money on that thing or there's nothing they want to spend money on. Yeah. Um, and so they're hesitant to just throw some money in uh, and not but when when they aren't necessarily sure in advance what they're going to be bidding on. Um, There's a, another tip. This is one we've. I personally prefer to reward people who are actually participating too. So if you're doing door prizes, I like to hand them out to people who are playing games 
instead of just everyone who walks in the door. Uh, but that's just me because it's an extra life gaming event. I want people to game. We usually do draws by using here's a here's an interesting hack. If you don't want to do raffle tickets, take two decks of cards and keep have them sorted in order and hand everyone out a card. And then when you do that, you pull another card out of the other deck and then you can shuffle your second deck to draw. And that'll give you a random person out of everything you had the first time. Uh, the other thing you can do is that way everyone can only win once because when they win something, they hand the card back in. That's a trick we've been doing for 10 years, at least for local events. That's something I, I think it's Knights of Columbus thing. My parents learned. But I only give cards to people who play games. So if you're just going to kind of go around and like, great, buy some baked goods and it's awesome you came out to support us. But part of it, it's a gaming marathon. Play some games. Now, one thing D brought up in the chat room is uh, bringing a float. So uh, starting yeah. starting bank, uh, Major Kayla was saying is another term uh, in, in Canada, I've or at least in Ontario, I've always heard it as float. And that's the money yeah. you need to sort of get, get everything going and to give change. It is yeah. really important to have that and not just a little bit, because if you're running a bake sale and an auction and cheat jars and all these other things, uh, you can really run into some, you know, if everyone shows up with $20 bills, and yep. wants to spend one dollar here and one dollar here, you need a way to enable that. So <laughs> it's really important to have that float or a starting bank available uh, right there from the get go. You know, plan ahead, go to the bank, get your rolls of quarters or dollars or whatever it is you need, uh, and be prepared to make change right away. Yeah, and a shout out to Jeff in the chat. He is the DCC. I don't know what's DCC called their game masters. I don't remember GM who uh, I think raised the most money at our extra life tournament last year. I'm not sure if he beat out the D and D table that played for 28 hours straight. It and, was and, is, and Jeff is if for anyone reading our chat room, a big supporter of the cheat jar. Yes. Uh, and considering running a higher level module for low level characters where you have to cheat to win. Exactly. Right. That's, that's the kind of thing you do, right? That's, that's why you can do it. He did beat out the D and D table. So I couldn't remember the D and D table did really well. Um, they did really good at our level up event. So they're going to be back judge. Thank you. Judge, I, I should have known that judge. I knew, I knew it wasn't the, um, <laughs> all right. So that is, this has been an awesome chat room today. Thank yeah. you very much for everyone who uh, jumped in, but that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhog. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. Uh, if you got a question for us, just again, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.